St. Dominic's family by Sister Mary Jean Dorsey, Order of Preachers. Episode 1, St. Dominic, 1170 to 1221. The master of paradox was this 13th century friar who established the foundations of democracy in the depressing days of feudalism and laid out with a globe circling sweep the plans that would convert a world no one had yet dreamed about. It is doubtful if any other man, saint or not, accomplished so much in so short a lifetime or expressed so unequivocally his faith in the future. Dominic de Guzman was born in Old Castile around 1170. His father was Castellan of a fort on the border of Christian Spain, and the two older sons of the family were already studying for the priesthood when Dominic was born. In the ordinary course of events, the boy would have been trained to arms, but his mother's pleading and his evident talent for study determined that he too would be given to the church. Taking his studies at the University of Palencia, he was ordained and soon afterwards joined the chapter of Augustinian canons at Osma. He was made prior of the canons at an early age. A contemporary description says of him, straight away he began to appear among his brother canons as a bright ray of sunshine. In humbleness of heart the least, in holiness the first, shedding around him the fragrance of quickening life, like the sweet scent of pine woods in the heat of a summer's day, and advancing from strength to strength as does the wide-growing olive and the slender, lofty cypress, day and night he frequented the church, ceaselessly devoted to prayer, scarcely venturing beyond the cloister walls, the more to find leisure for his lone thoughts with God. His whole life is mirrored in this picture of the devout and quiet young priest, happy in the cloister solitude with its double obligation of choral office and teaching of the truths of God. In 1203, his cloistered peace was disturbed by the bishop, who summoned him to go on a diplomatic mission to the marches, possibly Denmark. Dominic could not have known it, but the peace of the Spanish cloister was never to be his again. As they traveled through France, he met the heresy, which was to be his principal adversary in life, the teaching of the Albigensians. It had devastated the whole of the southern provinces. Convinced that someone should preach the truth to these benighted people, he discussed with his bishop the project of giving missions among them. Both he and the bishop had hoped to go to Tartary as missionaries when the diplomatic journey was over, but found themselves instead involved in the troubles of France. Commissioned by the Pope to assist the Cistercians in preaching against the Albigensians, Dominic and the bishop worked with a few companions. The bishop died, the Cistercians went home discouraged, and Dominic was left with a handful of followers, linked to him by only uh, mutual unwillingness to abandon the people of France to heresy. At this unpropitious time, Dominic decided to organize his followers into a group with papal commission to preach. He made several trips across Europe to get this permission, finally obtaining it in 1216. Mm -hmm. By this time, Dominic was the center of a great deal of action as well as prayer. A group of nine women heretics he had converted were established at Pruy in a convent. There, they could assist with prayer and good works in the preaching activities of the brethren. Sixteen men of many nationalities had thrown their lot with him and were willing to share with him in the business of world conquest. An unnumbered band of interested seculars, most of whom were knights and wealthy men and their women folk, hovered like bees around the work of Dominic. He organized them into chapters of active religious helpers even before the order obtained papal approval. Hence it was from the very first an order with multiple attacks on the evils of the world. The preachers worked among the men of the schools and argued with the most learned heretics in public disputations. The nuns taught the daughters of the nobility who might otherwise fall into the clutches of the heretic teachers. And the men and women of the militia of Jesus Christ pledged their swords and their fortunes to the needs of the church. We have today so many orders and institutes patterned on the Dominicans that it is hard for us to remember that in many of the, its most characteristic features, the Dominican order was a startling innovation. In an age when church and state gave no thought to any form of government except monarchy, Dominic arranged that his brethren should elect their priors, who would rule for only a limited time, and that all should have a part in the legislation of the order. Nations which have since established democracies owe a great deal to this quiet Spanish priest who insisted on building a democracy at a time when even the word was unknown. Dominic was the first founder to insist that the rule did not bind under pain of sin, only under the penalty fixed for its violation. His rule was meant to make the way to heaven easier, not harder. 
he was the first to propose an order dedicated to preaching at a time when no one but bishops regularly preached. With insight that we can bless today, he foresaw that one might preach in many ways and in many media, so he made veritas the motto of the order and did not limit the ways or means by which one might preach it. Mm -hmm. Lastly, his order was organized to cope with problems of future centuries and lands that had not even been discovered in his day. There is nothing in the Dominican rule to prevent the evangelization of any continent, or of Mars for that matter. Its application is flexible in order to meet the problems of all times and places. We know the story of Dominic's last years. He spent five years as head of the order, a pitifully short time. Yet in that brief period, he attracted to the order so many of the saintly and talented men of the times that his death did not in the least menace the carrying out of his ideal. Men who had heard him preach went off joyfully to die in Tartary, or to debate with heretics, or to teach in the universities, or to teach catechism to the young. Five years of his magnetic presence was enough to magnetize the whole order, so to speak, so that in the first hundred years of its existence, it would draw nearly 30,000 members from all the countries of Europe and start on its way around the world. St. Dominic died in Bologna on August the 6th, 1221, and his return from the second general chapter of the order. He had lived long enough to see his order established firmly, uh, enough so that no persecution or trouble would shake it. Dying, he promised his weeping brethren that he would be of more use to them in heaven than he was on earth, a promise which he has kept abundantly in the seven centuries since. The burial of St. Dominic took place, according to his wishes, in extreme simplicity. He was buried in a modest grave under the feet of his brethren. Here he remained until the urging of Pope Gregory IX, who was the personal friend of his, gave rise to the first translation of his relics. This translation took place in 1233 at the time of a general chapter. Blessed Jordan presided over the ceremony and all were filled with great emotion as the relics were exposed after 12 years burials. Testimonials were given in writing of the sanctity of Dominic by those who had worked with him and knew him best. Pope Gregory IX had the evidence carefully preserved and in the following year, he proclaimed that Dominic de Guzman was the saint of God and entitled to the highest honors of the church. The news reached the master general, Blessed Jordan, on August the 5th, 1234. The feast of the saint had to be transferred from the 6th, which was the day of his death, because this was the feast of the transfiguration. August the 4th was the feast day appointed by the Pope. 